At a very basic level, quantum computing is like classical computing on steroids. Quantum computing depends on qubits, where a unit that can have multiple values simultaneously. It's like holding a coin in your hand that is heads, tails, and everything in between. A qubit can be held in something called a superposition. For a non-technical person, I think it's just useful to know that this these quantum computers are far more powerful computers than we've seen in the history of mankind. Quantum computers will be capable of making calculations, identifying relationships, digging deep into massive amounts of data in ways that we've never seen before. So it's going to completely revolutionize the field of computing. The rewards that I think governments would like to see are the kinds of rewards they saw with the dawn of the commercial internet. In a world of ever-changing international threats. Here was a technology that was developed by the U.S. military. With quantum, I think there's the same gamble that we develop this um, technology. It will first and foremost allow governments to secure themselves. But beyond that, I think governments and the private sector see this as a winner because it will absolutely transform and upend the existing computational infrastructure that we have. So the sooner you get out there and you demonstrate a viable product, certain kinds of information absolutely will be inaccessible except for to those that are endowed with that quantum capacity. I came from the generation of the commercial internet. Can you explain what internet is? Today we'll show you the growing power of the internet. That was a really exciting time because it felt genuinely like here's something new that feels like it can improve us as human beings. At that time there was this really optimistic discourse. And I think what we've seen, certainly from the perspective of social science, that some of that optimism maybe hasn't quite come to fruition and there's reason to pause and think about what has gone well and what hasn't gone so well. So we were really eager to understand what happens to you when you go online, when you are in cyberspace. And not necessarily enough about what happens when you're not online. What happens to those that aren't part of this um, socio-technical transformation. In this um, current time period, it feels like when we introduce as transformative a technology as quantum computing, it's a bigger question about the distribution of power. One way to read the introduction of quantum computing is in James Bond terms. There's going to be a rogue actor and there's going to be a good actor. And the good actor hopefully will overcome the bad rogue actors in acquiring this technology. I repeat, the enemy is blown up. That scenario is not going to play out. But at the same time, there will be a scenario where the institutions, be they private sector or public sector, that have the um, ability to make use of quantum, those institutions will certainly accrue more decision-making power. We're going to see the, this new technology definitely unfairly deployed in ways that will make some institutions, organizations, some entities feel like they have a leg up in terms of what they know about people what they know about how the world works, and their ability to define which problems are worth answering. In the field, I've encountered many uh, advocates and organizers uh, for digital rights, for defending digital rights and human rights more broadly, who have wondered whether their efforts to bring awareness about the potentially harmful effects of new technologies comes too late. And wondering, well, what can we do to start early, to intervene in this process earlier so that it doesn't feel like this is just inevitable? Could we have a reality TV show where quantum uh, computing scientists <laughs> are in the room with ordinary people talking about on the one hand, 
the excitement and the potentiality of quantum computing <laughs> and uh, you know sort of ordinary people talking about how they live their lives and what they hope their lives will become and seeing what happens because as things stand now there is this enormous gap um, that needs to be dealt with earlier on and yeah that might be a reality tv show uh, it might not be there are many different ways that we could speak back, fight back, talk back, intervene in the governance of technology. And I think we need to think creatively about those because some of the more conventional ways that this has been happening are stuck. They're not necessarily working. The most common way of answering this question about what kind of interventions uh, do we need is to think about diversifying the tech force, right? And I don't entirely buy that, in part because we're investing a lot, of, putting a lot of faith in sort of the ordinary programmer, the ordinary tech worker to institute these changes. We have examples of people also having very politicized concerns around the use of Microsoft's technology in Gaza, right? In the case of uh, companies seeing protest from within their very walls, right? Often what you see is that they get rid of those workers and then they carry on with the work that they're doing. And what I wonder about are these more unlikely intervention points. So I'll give an example. I've often wondered about our pensions and the ways in which these pensions are tied to companies that are reliant on this accelerated growth model. The more that these companies accelerate, um, the more likely it is that we will have happy pensions. What I'd like to think about with refusal is identifying other domains like that one, me as a pension holder, where we can begin to think about our relationship to the choices that technology companies make um, and the freedom that I have as a pension holder to influence those choices. And that seems like a, an untapped area for exploration since the early 20th century. I think scientists have only fantasized that this would be possible and now we're seeing it come to fruition. But at what cost and with what impact on the distribution of power in society, right? The, I think those questions are equally important to be posing particularly at this time.